Now we will move on to the first plenary session for today on media pluralism. Indeed, also challenging issues and perhaps not so tangible to address. The aim of this panel is to broaden up a discussion on ensuring plurality and values in a converged media environment, looking at monitoring of national level freedom and pluralism of the media. And before I do my small introductory remarks, I would like to call on the speakers to take the floor and I will introduce them shortly. So, uh, we can all agree that media pluralism is vital for our society, since it forms such an intrinsic form uh, and link to media freedom and freedom of expression. Providing citizens with a variety of views can only strengthen a democracy since well-informed citizens make uh, well-informed decisions. So the question is really how to secure it. On a national level, there has traditionally been several ways of intervening in the media market in order to secure pluralism. We have support of public service broadcasting, we have public funding of the press, and of course media ownership regulation uh, that has been used as a tool to achieve this. On EU level, to the contrary, media policies related to media pluralism has traditionally been limited to broadcasting and only in matters that regards consumer protection and promotion of a common market for audiovisual media services. So the EU Parliament's many calls over the years uh, for EU legislation on media concentration and ownership have so far efficiently been rejected. However, there are several initiatives over the last year that indicate that the EU has started to take a more active approach to protecting media freedom and media pluralism. We've had two important uh, consultations. One uh, on the report of the High Level Group on uh, media freedom and pluralism and one on the independence of audiovisual media regulators. Moreover, we have had EU-initiated and EU-funded projects on monitoring pluralism and at the national level, and we've had uh, research initiatives on media accountability and uh, transparency. The converged media landscape has given us an abundance of output and thus potentially more diversity. Nevertheless, new challenges to media plurality have been created. The high level group was concerned about the gatekeepers new and increased role and its effect on media pluralism. Those actors we previously only looked at as technical terminals has become content providers, but they still remain unregulated. We have the internet service providers that have the possibility to block access to content, and that is why uh, rules on net neutrality becomes uh, so important. And then, of course, we have the intermediaries that, uh, such as search engines, social media, and other news aggregators that increasingly are using filtering mechanism to personalize content for its users. And this potentially decreases traditional media's role as editors, who has made sure that public interest content is available to all. So why should the EU be concerned about media pluralism and what needs to be done? That is really the question that we will be dealing with on this panel. I will raise some issues to begin with, also for the floor to start to, to think. 
And uh, one of them is, uh, is it possible to find reliable indicators on a national level to monitor media and media pluralism? And how would it enhance plurality to implement an institutionalized system of national monitoring on EU level? Is there a need of minimum standards on ownership regulation on EU level, such as accountability and transparency? Or are the states in a better position to deal with media pluralism, given its different political and cultural contexts? Context. Is there a need to be concerned about the digital intermediaries' editorial activities? And how should we address it? both in terms of possible regulation and monitoring. And this leads me to the last question, which is a more uh, broader question maybe, and not perhaps only for this panel, but for us to think about. And that is, and also on a maybe a more provocative note, is it foreseeable that EU uh, may manage to uphold the distinction between regulation of the telecom sector on one side and audiovisual media on the other side in the future? Or do we move towards a common directive? So to answer these questions and more, we have three very distinguished speakers. Uh, we have uh, nearest to me, Susanne Fengler. She is a professor of international journalism and a director at the Institute of Journalism at Dortmund University. She's also the director of the EU-funded project Media Act and Media Accountability and Transparency in Europe. Then we have Peggy Walker. She is a research professor in ICT and media law at the University of Leuven and a part-time professor at the European University Institute in Florence. She has uh, been working on numerous research projects over the years. I will only mention that she was uh, the project leader of the EU-funded monitoring study on media pluralism in Europe in 2008-2009, which she will come back to. And she also most recently served as a member of the Google's Advisory Council on the Right to be Forgotten ruling. Then we have Steve Gettings. He is the Director of International Affairs at Ofcom, the British media regulator, we have, where he has a long career leading many high-profile initiatives, including one advising the government on media plurality. Besides, he is chairing the ERGA subgroup on material jurisdiction uh, on the scope of the directive. So they will all have about 10-15 minutes each to present their possible solutions before I open up the floor for uh, questions and, and intervention in general statements. And I will also try in the end to give them, um, the, the speakers, a possibility for, an, uh, for a short end remark. So uh, we will start up with Peggy. Thank you so much, Ingvil, for the nice introduction, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me today and for putting this topic on the agenda. Um, it is a crucial topic, and it hasn't been on audiovisual conferences programs in previous years and the previous EU presidency, so I'm very happy that uh, uh, it has been, or it's part of the agenda today. Um, the session, our session has a long title, Ensuring Plurality in Values in a Converged Media Environment, Monitoring of National Level Freedom and Pluralism of the Media. So I will basically say a little bit about three elements that I see in this title, which is monitoring, of course, ensuring plurality, and then the converged media environment. And to give short answers to your questions, can we device common indicators and do we need monitoring, um, uh, standardized monitoring in my view, yes. Do we need to have stronger legal safeguards to ensure media pluralism, stronger safeguards at the EU level, in my view, yes. And how do we tackle with 
new intermediaries, new actors in the value chain. Um, there I would like to suggest independent academic research to find solutions that can form or uh, offer an alternative to, for instance, recommendation engines that commercial actors offer. But I will explain myself in more detail in the next 10 minutes. So first with regard to monitoring, do we need monitoring? Um, well, if you want to tackle a problem, of course you need to know what the problem is, what the underlying causes of the problem. Um, the idea of EU-wide monitoring of media pluralism is an idea that goes back, if I remember well, to the Liverpool uh, conference organized by the uh, UK presidency in 2005. Uh, in preparation of the review of the TV Without Frontiers directive. And as a follow-up, um, the European Commission launched in 2007 the so-called three-step approach, um, the Reading-Wallström approach. And the first step was this Commission staff working document. And the second step was commissioning a study that would come up with common standards. And as Ingvil pointed out, I had the honor um, to be the project leader for that study. Uh, we worked on, um, together with over 50 researchers in different EU member states and also from outside the EU to develop a monitor that would ap adopt what the Commission uh, itself labeled as a holistic approach because in the Commission staff working document, it was highlighted that media pluralism is wider than ownership issues, ownership plurality. Uh, this was um, the approach in the 90s by the European Commission when it uh, proposed actually an initiative to harmonize ownership rules. A proposal that never was, they call it, because it was never officially launched, uh, obviously, or apparently there was too much political um, pressure or opposition against the idea. So therefore, the idea of monitoring seemed attractive because it was less, um, or considered less intrusive, I, I assume, by the member states. So we were given the task to come up with a monitor that would look at different aspects of media pluralism and we suggested six dimensions uh, ownership plurality pluralism of um, or cultural pluralism in the media political pluralism geographical pluralism media types and genres and then what we called a basic domain looking at or assessing certain indicators uh, looking at preconditions for free and pluralistic media so this is the so-called MPM, the Media Pluralism Monitor that we, um, that we um, presented to a stakeholders meeting in June 2009. That was welcomed by some observers, some actors, some stakeholders, and that was cursed by many others. Um, we were even accused of having invented the atomic bomb or compared with the inventors of the atomic bomb by some people. But um, nevertheless, the, um, after some silence in the years 2010-2011, um, um, the uh, new commissioner, Nelly Cruz, she, um, um, well, she decided first to set up a high-level group um, and uh, a center in Florence and because of pressure by the European Parliament in the end she also decided to give it a try and to um, do a pilot test of the media pluralism monitor and this was carried out or coordinated by the Center for Media Freedom and Media Pluralism at the European University Institute in Florence and it was first tested in nine countries, including uh, Belgium, the UK, France, Hungary, Italy, Bulgaria. Um, and the results have been published recently. So you can find um, the results of that pilot test on, on the website of the EUI, the CMPF. Um, the test was successful in the sense that uh, I believe we, we have proven that the methodology can work. Uh, we also found out that some indicators need further fine-tuning. Well, first, I forgot an important issue, and that is that 
actually the CMPF was asked to reduce the size of the monitor. Uh, the initial monitor that we proposed contained 166 indicators uh, looking at uh, legal safeguards, economic, um, the economics of the markets, and then what we call sociodemographic indicators. That system was maintained, but the focus of the new monitor, the 2014 version, lies on uh, news and information. And uh, some indicators that involve resource uh, intensive content analysis have been taken out, some other indicators have been merged. So now there are 34 indicators still in the same six domains, um, yeah, cultural pluralism, political pluralism, and so on, um, that have been suggested as the uh, common, um, a common framework to monitor media pluralism in Europe. Um, the work will continue because the CMPF will now carry out a pilot test in the other countries, member states, and it will also further fine-tune indicators, especially with regard to the so-called digital or online uh, indicators. European Commission uh, asked them uh, to, to further fine-tune those or come up with alternatives. And I think that the work that Ofcom has been doing, is doing, uh, could be very valuable in that regard. What will happen afterwards? We don't know, but um, in any case, I think that there is quite some support eh, to continue an EU-wide monitoring process. This was stressed by the high-level group on media pluralism and freedom in its report of January 2013, also by the European Parliament in its resolution of May 2013 on the EU Charter, um, the Council of the EU in, no in its conclusion of November 2013, so not last year, but the year before, um, uh, stressed that uh, it wanted the Commission to continue supporting the independent monitoring tool for assessing risks to media pluralism implemented by the EUI and encourage its further use by member states and relevant stakeholders. So maybe the continuation uh, might look differently. Uh, it might be done in cooperation with the independent media regulators. Um, from my own experience, the implementation in Belgium um, I had the pleasure to cooperate uh, with the Flemish media regulator, with the CSA, the Conseil Supérieur de l'Audiovisuel, and with the Medienraad. And these, the media regulators have already a lot of data, so if you can find a cooperation between an academic institution and regulators, this could be very um, beneficial, a very um, uh, satisfying solution in, in my view. You asked me this morning at breakfast um, whether it was painful for me to see uh, the monitor being reduced. Uh, it's like they cut off an arm of your baby, but um, I understand why it was necessary to, to reduce the size because the Commission, uh, needs, if, if they want to implement this or convince stakeholders that this is useful, it needs to be something that's very user-friendly. And even though we developed the initial monitor, with the view of making a user-friendly tool uh, that would be feasible to implement. Um, we might have been a bit too ambitious um, in, in the beginning and it would have uh, yeah, required quite some resources to, uh, to, to score the 166 indicators. So in the interest of feasibility and uh, practicability and actually doing something with the monitor, I. Um, I, um, I can live with, uh, with the reduction, so to say. In academics, they say you need to be able to kill your darlings, unless it's more. You need to publish a lot, so shorter articles and whatever isn't uh, redundant or less relevant, we need to be able to get rid of it. So um, I was, I'm able to kill my darlings if it uh, serves a good purpose. So if, Thanks to this standardized and independent monitoring, we're able to pinpoint where the problems, the risks lie, because it's a risk-based tool that assesses risks in, in the member states. If we know where the risks are, um, how can we solve the problem? Do we need more EU harmonization? Well, what do, as Ingvil already pointed out, what we have today is limited, or rules, harmonized rules are limited to the broadcast sector and basically uh, deal with the cultural quota, European works, events list, short news reporting. 
but in my view, there's scope for further harmonization, and especially with regard to media ownership. Now, probably um, the Commission's answer, Lorena's answer would be, well, that's not an internal market problem. Uh, can you actually show that there's a, a problem for the free flow uh, of, of media because of difference, uh, differences in media ownership rules? Well, let me remind you that the first initiative in the 90s was actually a media ownership uh, tool, and I don't think it was buried at the time because there were not sufficient uh, internal markets arguments, but because of political reasons. And I was once asked to, to give a speech in the Libe Committee of the European Parliament, and I ended that speech by saying, isn't it odd that there's a directive that protects European citizens from watching sex on free-to-air linear TV at four o'clock in the afternoon, but it doesn't protect these same citizens from watching content that might be unduly influenced uh, by political, economic powers. What are the values that we want to protect here? And transparency in media ownership is still problematic. Um, there uh, has been, uh, I've, I've worked on the background report for the Parliamentary um, Committee of the Council of Europe last year, and I relied on a study by Access Info Europe, but also um, the work uh, from the Mirovny Institute, uh, Brankica Petkovic and Sandra Hervatin, uh, pub they published a book last year, Media Integrity Matters, which shows that in many European countries, but the Access Info study showed also in EU member states, uh, transparency on media ownership is still lacking and still problematic. So, in my view, there is a scope to harmonize or to impose certain minimum standards in an EU directive also to perhaps not necessarily um, include material provisions on concentration, but install a common mechanism that the regulators could apply on top of merger uh, control uh, provisions, comparable to, for instance, the UK plurality test. Conflict of interest rules to prevent the concentration of media, political, economic power in the same hands. And then in working group three yesterday, uh, the issue of findability, due prominence for general interest content or public value content was discussed. I'm not going to come back to that. Independence of media regulators, which is also an important aspect uh, in order to ensure pluralistic media markets, because if your media regulators who are supposed to monitor the market are not, don't have sufficient safeguards for independence, this can be very problematic. And it is striking that in the telecom sector, in data protection, there are these strong legal safeguards for the independence of the regulatory authorities, but not in the media sector. And then I've also put here on my slide intellectual privacy. With that, I refer to the idea that was launched by the high-level group um, on media freedom and media pluralism, the possibility to switch off profiling tools when consuming media content. Eh? So more and more um, media content is coming towards us on the base of personalized offerings, which certainly have their benefits. Um, you lose less time with spend, uh, or you, on, on irrelevant uh, things. But I strongly believe that citizens should have the choice to use them or not. Um, Oh, with regard to ownership, I just wanted to point out that uh, the European Citizens Initiative for Media Pluralism also considered that a very important aspect, uh, of, of, uh, aspect for further harmonization. You may know uh, that the, they didn't succeed in raising a sufficient number of signatures, which shows how difficult it is to sell to the general public the importance of these issues. It's not like advocating for clean water. Everybody understands the importance of clean water, but it's much harder to convince the general public about the importance of having uh, free and independent media. Perhaps, sadly, now they might realize more after what happened in, in Paris and in, in, in Copenhagen, but it shows the importance of politicians, decision makers, taking up their res responsibility. And finally, with regard to uh, the importance of also doing independent research on 
alternative solutions to deal with, I would call the information abundance nowadays. Um, I would like to raise your attention for two examples of research projects, um, one of which in, uh, I'm currently involved in. This is the REVEAL project. Uh, it's funded by under the seventh framework program of the European Commission, but falls under the auspices of DG Connect. And it's, um, the aim is to develop social media verification tools to support, amongst others, journalists and to select the right sources to pick up accurate tweets or posts. So by combining online, um, so combining text mining, semantic search, multimedia forensics, um, the idea is to develop tools that will reveal, and there, that's where the na name comes from, modalities about the contributor, the content of uh, the, the social media content and the, the context, so telling you more about the reputation, the history, popularity of the contributor, for instance. And again, this will be shown in a um, um, uh, kind of colorful instrument, red, orange, green, showing how trustworthy, how reliable, how accurate a particular post is in order to help journalists uh, to, to avoid mistakes when they pick up news uh, or um, um, when they select uh, stories that they find on social media. And the idea is also to develop uh, or to say something about the so-called high-level modalities like the controversiality of an issue. And this comes already in the direction of media pluralism and diversity. So wouldn't it be great if we could uh, help journalists um, to find oppose opposite views on a particular topic uh, through automatic means so that they can themselves form an idea of what I'm putting in my story. Does it reflect the different views on, on this issue? So that is the idea. And the second research project um, is funded by the European Research Council to the University of Amsterdam, my colleague, Professor Nathalie Hellberger. Um, and that actually reminds me of what Chris Hutchinson of uh, Liberty yesterday uh, said in response to a question from the audience, how can your recommendation engine actually dealing with finding minority language programming or regional politics? And basically the answer was, well, the recommendation engine recommends what the consumer wants. And that might be a very important problem in the future. There are a lot of initiatives nowadays to nudge you towards healthy food. What can we do to nudge people towards a healthy media diet? And it sounds scary, I know. It sounds like brainwashing, manipulation. But that is why it's important that academic research is being done on these issues because they will nudge us to certain content and it will be commercially driven. So let's find ways or let's research, analyze how it would look like if we would build in other values like plurality, pluralism, diversity in these tools that will guide us through information in the future. So that is her project about can we actually uh, nudge citizens towards healthier media diets? Can we in technical terms, but also from a normative perspective, and what are the limits under the human, within the human right, within a human rights framework? How can we use big data for that? Because big data will be used to select for us. Algorithms will select material for us because there's simply too much out there uh, to consume. So let's find alternatives. And wouldn't it be great if public broadcasters, for instance, would also work on that? Thank you. I think I used more than 10 minutes. I'm sorry for that. Thank you, Peggy, for your interesting presentation. Um, you argued the need to harmonize uh, certain minimum standards on uh, EU level, uh, such as on transparency, and that leads me over to the next presenter, Susanna, who will talk about, among other, transparency. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this panel and to give me the chance to present you 
the results of a EU-funded research project. We and a number of colleagues across Europe and the Arab world have conducted in recent years and are still continuing and expanding. So I would like to present to you two projects, a media accountability index, as well as the European Journalism Observatory, two tools um, and instruments which are interested um, to promote journalistic quality, which is something I think we um, should all be aware of that is endangered in today's ever more competitive media world. Um, we have more and more information, but less and less quality journalism, and um, our tools uh, are looking for ways to keep up um, an informed public by ensuring standards and quality in journalism. Um, the research our initiatives are based on is a EU funded project we have been conducted in the past we have been conducting in the past years it 's been a project called Media Act Media Accountability and Transparency in Europe, fourteen countries in Europe, or parts of Europe as well as two exemplary Arab states have been involved in this project and uh, we proceeded in three steps we first did a status quo analysis of media accountability and media self-regulation in the participating countries, followed up by qualitative interviews with roughly 100 experts in the field of innovative media accountability and self-regulation mechanisms, um, because I think you all know and have observed that um, the internet offers much more room and flexibility for the media to prove that they are accountable and responsive to their audiences like online ombudsman, newsroom blogs, social media, and so on. So we were interested how this transforms the debate about self-regulation. And um, we conducted a representative survey of roughly 1,800 journalists in all participating countries about the impact of media self-regulation instruments from press councils to social media in European newsrooms uh, to find out which instruments work, which don't work, and what can be done to improve the situation. Um, we were interested in a broad um, study of media accountability and self-regulation, so we did not focus on the field of um, audiovisual media, which is in the focus of this conference, but also included, of course, print media, online media, news agencies, uh, and other forms of media. But I think also for this audience, it might be quite interesting to look at this because we are all dealing uh, with the converging media world and what happens in the audiovisual sector also affects the print sector and vice versa. So um, we looked at different media accountability and self-regulation instruments which could be highly formalized or less formalized, which could be closely associated with the journalistic field like press councils or code of ethics, but which could also be um, more in the field of NGOs, um, of the audience, of um, external actors, like entertainment, like social networks, like citizens' blogs, and so on. And uh, we are currently doing a follow-up project, the European Handbook of Media Accountability, which monitors the status quo of media self-regulation and accountability in all EU member states, plus Russia, Switzerland, Turkey, and Israel. And um, we will present also with this project a media accountability index um, assessing the quality of self-regulation in all EU member states, and I will tell you more about it in a minute. I would like to bring to you four selected results of our research on media accountability and self-regulation in Europe. Um, first of all, we asked the journalists in our survey um, to assess which external factors endanger journalistic quality, and maybe not surprisingly, but very impressively, especially journalists from Central and Eastern Europe as well as Southern Europe and the Arab states told us that governmental pressure strongly endangers the quality of the media content being provided by the different media outlets in those countries. Um, but you also can clearly see, and this is the blue line um, in, this, um, in this table, that economic pressure also has a very heavy uh, impact on the quality of journalism. And this is 
uh, something virulent not only in the, let's say, less affluent countries like Romania or Estonia, um, Estonia but also in countries like Finland, like Netherlands and Germany, where we still have um, more or less uh, strong advertising markets supporting independent media. So this is something we could and should pay attention to. Um, it's not moving? Okay. Um, then uh, when we looked at the status quo and the infrastructures of media self-regulation across Europe, uh, we can clearly dif um, distinguish different cultures of um, media self-regulation. We do have um, the northern um, European countries where we do have um, functioning press councils on a national level. The UK is um, quite a difficult case right now and Steve will surely tell us more about it in a second. Uh, where we do have um, at least um, a minimum amount of media criticism in the mass media, so the media makes transparent what is going on in the media field, um, which debates are being carried out in the journalism sector about journalistic malpractice, about problems in, in the media field, um, and where we do have a variety of other accountability instruments like newsroom blogs, like ombudsman, um, like ways where the media can be responsive towards its audience, like transparency mechanisms. And especially in the, in the UK, you also find several NGOs dealing with media issues and by doing so, um, setting the media under certain pressure. Uh, on the contrary, if we look to um, many Central European states and Southern European states, we do have no or no functioning press council on a national level. We do have the problem that um, the field of journalism is not united, so there are usually several federations or unions of journalists who have all developed their own code of ethics, but there is no common code of ethics everybody can agree on and thus stick to it afterwards. Um, we have very little mass media criticism in the mass media, um, often because um, there is strong political parallelism between media and politics or because media is in the hand of um, business interests. So um, critical journalists have to um, turn to blogs where they can critically um, debate the status quo of media and of journalism in their field or in the country. And um, so we can observe an emerging media accountability culture online, um, but the um, institutional infrastructures are still far from being developed. And of course the situation is quite different in the Arab states um, because of decade-long um, censorship, I will not focus on this anymore today. Um, you can also see how uh, strongly the perception and impact of the different media accountability instruments varies in the different European newsrooms. Um, if you look to the answers the journalists we surveyed gave to the question um, if they um, ascribe high or very high impact to um, ethic codes on a professional level, issued by uh, federations or unions of journalists um, as compared to codes issued by media organizations like ethic codes um, given out by a specific newsroom or a media group. And you can clearly see that in the um, journalism cultures with a longer tradition uh, and with a higher degree of professionalism like UK, Finland, Netherlands, Germany, Austria and Switzerland, uh, journalists are much more willing to stick to professional, to common codes of ethics as compared to Central Eastern and Southern European countries where uh, company codes seem to be much more important um, for journalists to give them guidance about ethical behavior. But this could also be a huge danger because as you know, uh, in many countries, media are in the hand of media moguls, which have their very specific interests with the media, and if they determine what the standards in journalism are, this might be very dangerous for the future of journalism ethics and for journalism quality. And just a last slide from the research results. Um, you can also see how strongly the impact of press councils as a key instrument also um, debated by the high-level group of media pluralism and freedom, um, how strongly it varies in different European newsrooms. We have a um, strong support in countries like Finland and Switzerland, where we do also have, the case of Switzerland, um, a co-regulation approach towards media accountability and how weak, on the other hand side, the impact is in countries 
um, where we do not have a strong support both from the media companies and from the journalistic unions to create a joint and independent press council. So our answer to this is that it is very important um, for all stakeholders on the European and national levels to continue uh, monitoring the quality of media self-regulation to make sure that um, an independent institution and independent actors from the academic field and um, other fields closely associated with the media sector but have an independent eye on it, that they monitor the quality of media self-regulation in the different EU member states um, in order um, to foster a debate about media self-regulation, to encourage media companies uh, to install um, one or better more of those instruments to ensure dialogue and responsiveness towards the audience and other stakeholders. Um, also to create a ranking to find best practice examples in one country which can be transported to other countries and also to point media policy makers to weaknesses in a specific country or in a specific um, area um, and to make clear what can be done to improve the situation. And last but not least, it can also serve um, as a clear signal to um, countries seeking access to the EU, what is being expected from them in terms of media accountability um, if they want to meet joint European standards. Um, we did a pilot version of this media accountability index in the context of our EU project, um, um, where we uh, were able uh, to distinguish different cultures of media accountability using um, a scale of roughly 100 questions. I will not um, um, go in detail here, uh, but asking for the quality of media self-regulation, accountability, transparency as a keyword, and responsiveness and dialogue with the audience um, in the five key market player in each media segment, from print to online to broadcasting, because they usually dominate the market and make up more than 50% of the media market. Um, so what is being done here in terms of self-regulation and, um, and accountability and thus created a ranking which we think is quite helpful um, to discuss um, the quality of self-regulation and what needs to be done, especially because it also allows us um, to distinguish um, if the quality of infrastructures of media self-regulation is highly developed in the journalism internal field and also in terms of formalized institutions like press councils and eth ethic codes, uh, or if the majority of initiatives we can find is more in the informal and thus weaker sector um, and is more in the field of journalism external mechanisms. And um, in cases like this, we would strongly urge policymakers, stakeholders, actors in the field of media to invest more uh, to create stable institutions in the field of journalism internal and formalized institutions. And the second project I would like to briefly draw your attention to um, at the end of my presentation is the European Journalism Observatory. It's a project also very closely associated with the Media Act project. It's a project in um, 12 European countries with a heavy emphasis on Central Eastern Europe and Southern Europe in 12 languages. And the idea of this project is um, to um, create a debate about media research and how media practitioners can make good use of it. I think this is especially important for transformation countries where the um, status quo of communication research is still um, nascent and underdeveloped. So we want to make sure that media practitioners, especially in transformation countries, uh, can profit from media research, which has been researched and developed um, in other parts of Europe. We create a joint debate about it and we also um, conduct our own studies. Right now we're doing a study on the coverage of Ukraine in different countries um, to create um, a dialogue and make media professionals aware um, of interesting research results. That is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much and I look forward to the discussion. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Susanna. Also a very thoughtful presentation and also showing the importance of enhancing professionalism and accountability of uh, 
journalism into the debate on media plurality and how to assess it. So next and last speaker would be Steve. Thank you very much, Ingvil. You can hear me. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm going to tell a story about uh, the pluralism debate in the UK, and I'm going to break it down into to two parts that stretch over a period of five years. So if you find me delving back into the dim and distant past, please bear with me. It is all relevant. So really the, dis the recent discussion on pluralism in the United Kingdom started in, in late 2010 brought about by uh, a proposal by News Corporation to acquire 100% of the equity in our largest pay television platform, B Sky B. Now, the, the merger control regulations in uh, the UK allow for a public interest test to be conducted on that merger if it is uh, identified that the merger involves the coming together of two media enterprises. So uh, what we had is a request from our Secretary of State, our Minister for uh, Culture, Media and Sport, that we should undertake uh, a plurality test, if you like, on that uh, particular proposed acquisition. Uh, the phrase in the Act, the Act that we, we work within in this, in this area, uh, asks us to look at the plurality of persons with control over media enterprises. <clears throat> it's hard enough to say pronounce that phrase, let alone decide how to work out whether uh, there is sufficient plurality of persons with control over media enterprises. Um, just to make it even more challenging, we only had 40 working days to conduct that test. So quite a, a, a sprint, to say the least, to come up with a framework, this really having been the first opportunity and the first occasion that Ofcom had undertaken a test of this nature. Actually, that's not strictly true, but this was the most substantive uh, test that we'd had to undertake. Um, so a big challenge in late 2010. Um, middle of 2011, some of you m might be aware, and we heard this from the speakers yesterday, there were concerns raised in the UK about journalists uh, gaining unauthorized access to people's uh, voicemails, and there was a judicial inquiry led by a judge called Levison looking into the practices of journalists in the UK at that time. And in parallel with that, uh, we were asked, Ofcom were asked, to answer for the Secretary of State a series of questions relating to pluralism in the UK and how to measure it effectively. Now, why was this relevant to the, the, the earlier part of the story? Well, when we looked at the News Corporation B Sky B case, we did conclude that there might be some cause for concern, the bringing together of a large newspaper group uh, with a platform operator that offered uh, UK viewers a, a, one of the more popular 24-hour news channels. But perhaps more significantly, we, we raised an institutional concern about the fact that there was no regular means of assessing how pluralistic the UK's news market was. The only occasion when we were able to do that was at the point when there was a merger between media enterprises. In other words, any organization could grow organically and acquire organically market share in the news media market, and that development would come under no scrutiny, and that, that was a concern that we raised at the point when we, we undertook our public interest test. So, Secretary of State asked us five questions. We gave him that advice uh, in the middle of 2012, so we're moving through part one of this story, uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. So the, the questions he asked us were, oh, sorry, just before I do that, uh, the questions he asked us were predicated on a view we took on what a plural outcome looks like in the, in the UK media market. And, and the view that we took is that pluralism is a means to an end. Uh, what it's designed to achieve is, is the creation of a diversity of viewpoints. You've, you've heard some of this from, from the other speakers already. Diversity of view, viewpoints informed citizenship, better decision-making, um, a, a debate in society about matters of public policy and industrial controversy, as, as we would describe it. And that as a result of that, you prevent any undue influence over political processes. There's transparency, there's debate, there's well-informed opinions being expressed, and people are able to synthesize all of that into their own point of view. The other issue that we had to look at is the, is the scope of how we would go about assessing pluralism in the light of the questions that the Secretary of State had asked us. 
And what we uh, decided to do uh, was focus our attention on news and current affairs content. Now, not everybody agreed with that. Uh, inevitably, we went out to consultation on all of this, and there were many consultation respondents who suggested we should take a much broader view and a broader perspective. I think from the, from the perspective of, of both principle and practicality, we decided our judgment was that we should uh, continue to focus on news and current affairs, those genres being the, having the greatest bearing on the way that we felt people and citizens uh, developed and, and formed their, their opinions. So, on to those questions. So, the, the, the questions are ones that we've, we've heard a little bit about already this morning. How do you measure pluralism? Uh, how should online, and, uh, online content and websites be dealt with? Uh, what might trigger a plurality review? If we don't just have a plurality review at the point of a media merger, what should be the circumstances under which uh, a plurality review might happen? Um, should there be any lim limits on market share? Uh, within the news media market. And then finally, how do we include the BBC uh, in any framework? Uh, and I'll come back to the last question later on if, if some of you are wondering why, why that was part of the question, set of questions. So as far as uh, measuring plurality is concerned, we, we came to the conclusion uh, that, first of all, there's an abundance of, of measurement systems and metrics that focus on individual platforms, or at least there are in the UK, there are in many other member states as well. So we weren't going to ignore and set to one side um, those platform by pl platform metrics, um, but we did I identify uh, a flaw in all of them, which is that they focus on one single platform. So our, our strong recommendation is that increasingly the focus should be on cross-platform measurement the extent to which consumers, uh, citizens, take in news and current affairs content across TV, radio, print, and online. The other point we wanted to make, and we, we, uh, we recommended, is that in drawing any conclusions around pluralism, we felt very strongly there would always be an element of judgment in deciding whether or not there was a problem. Um, Within the UK, there are many different structures for governing the way that news organizations conduct their business, for example. There are many different ownership models. There are several different regulatory systems. And these are example of what, examples of what we call the contextual factors that we felt had to play a very important role in arriving at the judgment that I've, I've just mentioned. One other point that's, that's worth reflecting here is we had suggested that the quantitative measurement framework should focus on uh, availability of sources, the consumption of those sources, and the impact of that consumption on the way that people went about forming their opinions. Uh, now, I think it was Peggy who mentioned that in the 90s, there was a lot of focus on media ownership, on counting the number of providers of content. And that's very much in the, in the availability um, uh, bucket, if you like. Uh, and we, like Peggy uh, and Susanna, we, we've all drawn the same conclusion here, which is a holistic approach that takes account of a wide variety of factors, not just the suppliers of news, but how it's consumed and the impact it has on opinion forming is very important. So, alongside providing advice, over this five-year period, what I would say we have been able to do at Ofcom is put an increasing quantity of data into the public domain that is informing the debate about how you uh, uh, measure and interpret patterns of news consumption. So what I'm about to show you, you don't need to look at the data, I'll, I'll, very, I'll, I'll run through it very quickly. So what we have here, for example, is an attempt to describe how UK citizens are consuming news media across different platforms. So there are some who rely just on a newspaper, there are some who rely on TV and, and, and newspapers, there are some who rely on TV, newspapers and radio and so on and so forth. And this was uh, our attempt uh, in our regular news report to illustrate what the distribution of consumption looks like by platform. Next example is the debate with, uh, with, our, with our government and in the advice that we provided to our government uh, started to examine the number of news sources consumed by individuals over one platform. So here, for example, for those who claim that they use um, uh, TV as one means of consuming news, we've identified that typically they will consume two sources of news over that platform. So that might be Sky News and BBC News, for example. 
uh, overall, across the whole population sample that we survey, we've identified that typically uh, a consumer will claim, because this is claim consumption, to use around four different news titles um, in order to inform their opinions. That's another aspect of the cross-platform approach. And then finally, and underpinning all the data you've just seen, is, is what we call the share of references, which is our way of getting to this cross-platform metric and the data set that allows us to have, have views on how people go about consuming news across different platforms. So what we do is we ask survey respondents to tell us which are their principal sources of news in a typical week. Um, and we'll give the respondent the opportunity to name as many as they wish. Uh, each one of those uh, uh, references to a news source is then recorded, they're aggregated up, and then we analyze the data in lots of different ways. And, and this is an example of the way in which we can then describe how we think patterns of consumption of news in the UK are looking. So along the bottom, you have providers of different uh, news sources. We've got the BBC, ITV, television news provider, Sky, that's a, uh, a television news provider, commercial radio, and so on. Um, and I'm not sure if you can see who the big bar is at the, on the left-hand side, but that's the BBC. Uh, if we were to look at this from a wholesale perspective, in other words, who owns these different sources, you would be putting together um, News Corporation and Sky, for example, who are currently illustrated separately there. So this gives us some means of ascertaining, we think, how concentrated patterns of consumption are in the, in the news media market. So we were then asked by the Secretary of State to advise on online, and I think the answer we gave him was a very straightforward one, that increasingly, uh, online plays a very important role in news consumption, particularly a young, a young, among younger audiences, uh, that it was quite right that it should be included in there, uh, and that there were uh, a range of different ways in which online uh, services were delivering news content to, to uh, citizens and consumers, whether that be newspaper websites, television news websites, aggregators, search engines, social media, uh, and so on. Uh, what we highlighted is the dynamic nature of the market and the concern that we had that getting to a, a robust and stable set of online metrics might be quite challenging. Um, just to highlight that point about uh, younger people and their consumption of online news, here is an illustration of the most uh, important sources of news uh, for all adults by age. So along the bottom we, oops, apologies. Along the bottom we have different sources of news. Uh, the green bar are younger people. The red bar is older people, put crudely. So if I gray out some of this, what you'll see is uh, television news amongst people aged 55 plus uh, remains important and significant. The green bars show that actually the BBC website is almost as popular as BBC television news, and that provide on BBC One, that provides you with the sense of, of how potentially how demographic change may push the metrics towards the online space, if you like. Uh, we were asked about a trigger. I've already mentioned that we felt that the only trigger that existed in the UK regime, which was the a media merger, was insufficient, uh, and we looked at a range of different ways of uh, undertaking a review beyond merger. So we thought about measures and thresholds, we, we thought about uh, complaints and consumer complaints, and we also looked at the possibility of a very straightforward periodic review of pluralism uh, every three, every four, every five years. Um, I, I won't go into the rationale for why we picked the periodic review, but one of the points that we were particularly concerned about is ensuring that on the one hand there was the opportunity to assess the concentration of the UK market periodically. But on the other, ensuring that there, for industry, was some uh, certainty about when those reviews would happen to ensure that invest in investment incentives were maintained in a market which economically um, is, continues to be quite challenged. So what we didn't want to do was put in, in a regime that might impair incentives to invest, for example, in, in new media. So we picked, we were recommended to government that they should undertake a periodic review of plurality. 
we were also asked about market share caps, and for the reasons I've just described, the dynamic nature of the news consumption markets, the economic challenges facing certain sections of the news media market, particularly print media, um, we felt that recommending those market share limits at this point was inappropriate, which doesn't mean to say that we didn't have concerns about the progressive uh, accumulation of market share and the concentration of market share. We just didn't feel that uh, putting in place those limits was the appropriate w way of dealing with that at this point. And then we had the role of the BBC. So we have already seen in the data that I presented that uh, consistent with the BBC's charter and the agreement that it has with government, it uh, commands a significant share of references as far as news and current affairs are concerned. It's effectively what we ask it to do. So it's no surprise that it focuses on that objective and some would argue delivers on it. So, so our point here and our conclusion here is whilst the data needs to reflect the role of the BBC in our market, there is a separate governance uh, system for the BBC uh, which periodically looks at its, at its role and remit and the BBC's market share per se was, was no reason for a, a review of pluralism to be triggered. So, so that was part one. Part two uh, is uh, passage of time from uh, early 2013 to the present day. So we gave our advice to Secretary of State in the middle of 2012. Uh, around a year later, uh, the government published a consultation document asking for um, the public's view on uh, the conclusions that DCMS had drawn on pluralism, which to a, a fairly large degree accorded with the advice that we had provided. Uh, a year after that, the summer of 2014, the government published a statement on, on pluralism. And the, and the most significant part of that for Ofcom was uh, a further request that we should look uh, again into and make a recommendation on a definitive measurement framework. So the advice that we had already provided that you've heard about provided some sense of what the framework looked like. But now we were being asked to provide a very clear view on, on what measures, such measures should form that framework. And that's where we are today. We have, we, have, uh, uh, we have consulted once at the beginning of the project that we're running on, on this particular uh, activity. And tomorrow, unfortunately, because it means I can't tell you anything about it, <laughs> we will be publishing a consultation document on that measurement framework and the, and the measures that should form that framework. Um, so that's really where I conclude. Uh, I, hope, I hope that's been useful and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. I suggest that we uh, keep on this conference one more day so we can hear the results. But I'm sure you can access the website and, and read more about it. I think that we should um, elaborate a little bit more on this question of how to find uh, reliable indicators uh, on a national level to, to monitor media plurality. And obviously, it's a question what kind of services or what should be the scope, um, who should be assessed. And as you said, Steve, you, it is decided that you will include uh, online uh, delivery of uh, news and current affairs into your review. So I'm curious to, to hear more. Um, obviously, you can't present any findings, but still maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on how you would do this. Um, will it matter, for example, whether it is a human or an algorithm that has selected the output? So, um, uh, it is fair to say that over the four-year period I've just described, the, uh, we, Ofcom, have learned a lot about uh, how we can go about improving our measurement framework. So, I, I am answering your question, but I'm taking a step back a little bit. I mentioned that the, uh, the initial work we did uh, was only 40 working days. So, the share of references concept was one that we developed in that 40-day period. Um, the, the measures that we, uh, we delivered in that first piece of work came in for a significant amount of criticism, most of it from ourselves, actually. We, we heavily caveated the work that we'd undertaken. Um, but nonetheless, we felt that the concept, the idea of the cross-platform metric, 
was fundamental to arriving at a meaningful view of, of pluralism within the UK market. Uh, and it didn't matter how much you made use of established single platform measures, um, th they were unable to articulate uh, and indicate uh, the, the insight that we wanted to get to, which was the idea of uh, our citizens being well informed, can they contribute to democratic debate, do we have evidence that there is no undue influence over political processes by virtue of the fact that there are many independent voices available and being consumed. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I'm now answering your question, but what I, I suppose what I'd like to go on to say is, so we, we don't, initially the answer, the, the methodology we developed, we didn't think was definitive, but we think it's becoming more robust over time. And the way that's happening is by putting into the public domain all the evidence that we have for how we've gone about uh, gathering the consumer research. We've invited criticism where we've been able to deal with it, we've responded to it, and the methodology has improved and become more robust over time. One other thing we've done is we've started to produce a, a regular pack of, of information on, on news media consumption, some of which you've seen here. And that in itself has started to generate a debate within the UK, within uh, news media providers, uh, and within the academic community about what that robust framework of measures looks like. So I think the answer is we're getting there, uh, but we don't yet have the definitive solution. Maybe you would like to comment on it, Peggy. The same question? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just curious to know, because I think it's a major question here, how are we supposed to deal with the intermediaries when we're dealing with uh, monitoring and... and and assessment of in reliable indicators. I think of what that shows the importance of looking at the actual consumption and not just the supply, as, you, as Steve also stressed. So what are people consuming? And whether it's then delivered via the BBC or via Google News or... Um, so then you, you have a more or a better view on, on who should be the supplier that you also include in the analysis to assess how concentrated the supply side is, for instance. Now, uh, what we did in the MPM was that on the supply side, we included indicators on concentration uh, of ISPs, for instance, but we were dreaming of doing something that Ofcom suggested, um, but uh, you, you pointed out you did survey, so yeah. it's, it's quite time and resource consuming to do that kind of analysis so therefore we didn't have the means to do to, to include it in the pilot test unfortunately well only to a very limited extent we looked at um, at consumption but it's if we would have more resources it, it's it's a very meaningful indicator if you ask me and in f in the Flemish community um, uh, government sponsors um, well I minds is a research institute that is funded by the Flemish government and part of uh, one of the IMINES groups is um, every, every year they publish the Digimeter so they also look at what is the uh, news consumption of, of youngsters, the average public. And I think it's very, very useful to know that, uh, what, are the, what's, what are the consumption patterns uh, in, in terms of news consumption, where do people go to, to be informed. So, I'm a strong advocate or a strong supporter of including that type of measures in the metrics framework, if that answers yeah, your question. Definitely, definitely. Um, but whether it's an, an algorithm or, or a, a journalist selecting, I mean, there's always a company right behind it. So uh, somebody programs the algorithm. So you can... So intermediaries should be included? Yes, I think mm. so, yeah. Mm. Uh, in your presentation, uh, you argued that uh, it's not only needed to have a sort of institutionalized system of monitoring, we also need harmonized standards on EU level. But uh, the public consultation that followed the high level group's report weren't in favor of EU intervention uh, on this point. Uh, how likely uh, do you think it is that we will see some sort of uh, uh, work being done now in the refit exercise of the AVMS directive when it comes to to just trying to harmonize? Too unlikely. That's why I want to yeah. bring it on the agenda again. 
Why do you think there is this sort of opposition from the member countries? Not in my backyard, or uh, how do you say this in English? I mean, stay out of, uh, of our... We, we're going to say how our media market should look like. Um, that's my feeling. Mm. So maybe we should... Uh, this is a good time to, to open the floor. There are many regulators here, also some that uh, gave their views uh, in this consultation uh, process. So... Um, Anyone? There are microphones ready for you. Okay, there is one here on the first row. And please uh, tell your name and the organization you represent. Igor Korsic, Slovenian Ministry of Culture. A small question to Professor Peggy. Uh, what was the bomb about that you were talking? What? What were the objections that you referred to as an atomic bomb, almost? That you were accused of inventing atomic bomb? Because for, m for many stakeholders, this was seen as a first step of the European Commission to interfere with either the way they do business, uh, when it was criticism from, for instance, especially print media were very critical or cri very crit um, yeah they were very hostile towards the idea of being monitored because they have this strong tradition of self-regulation so any just the idea that somebody would monitor what they do and that this would be somehow under the auspices of of the eu or an eu funded body was scaring them and uh, if, if it came uh, from political side, it was mainly the argument that this, this is not the remit of the European Union, that uh, this is for member states to decide how they monitor and how they deal with concentration ownership issues. Okay, there's another question in the back. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about Facebook. Um, Facebook, they see themselves as um, a service, a social media service, and if you are in Facebook, you have to comply with their rules. And in Denmark, we had this book, and it was distributed through, through Facebook and through um, a lot of, uh, you know, the services they have on Facebook, and they put on apples uh, because on the front page of the book, there were naked people, it was about the flower power tradition. And the question here is, do we find, if we talk about this kind of intermediate services, do we find it's a, proper, uh, it's a good way to look into the new world that they have this kind of censorship on content deliverables? I'm asking this because what you said, Steve, is that young people are going online now. The way they are actually uh, learning the world, are getting news and so on, are through these kind of services. So if we want to have policies, should the AVMS directive of other kinds of EU policies actually embrace what they are actually doing on Facebook or Google and, and whatever? Do we think that? I think we have a big dilemma here. Thank you. Would you like to comment, Steve? Yeah, I, I can comment specifically on what our survey tells us about the behavior of younger people, which I think is, is very useful context. I, I have the slide here that I showed you earlier on, which shows that as a, as a, a source of references to news stories, Facebook plays a very important role in the lives of younger people. And here younger people are 16 to 24 year olds, so not, not that young. Um, in fact, in terms of a, being a principal source of news, Facebook, according to this data, was more popular than our uh, primary commercial channels news service. That's a very significant change um, from uh, older age demographics. So I didn't fully answer the first question you asked me, which you're kind of asking me also, which is what, what do we do with intermediaries? And I think the answer we gave is we can see the growing importance of the role that they're playing. They play all sorts of different roles. And the roles that they play have the power to potentially extend um, pluralism in the sense that you, uh, I certainly come across more news sources online than I read in print or on TV. Equally, 
there are potentially hypothetical, or at least we would see them in the UK as hypothetical concerns about gatekeeping uh, and censorship. And those are things that we said in our report needed to be uh, kept under review, although there wasn't evidence at this point for us to act. So that was the advice that we, that we gave. Susanna, would you like to make a comment on this? Or? Um, why not exactly on the regulation of Facebook? Because we are um, concerned about um, journalistic content and journalistic um, products. Um, of course, on the other hand side, we can see um, how people can use social media um, to make more or less qualified media criticism. Um, so this is, of course, the other side of um, the medal. And maybe again should be stressed um, how strong I think the connection is between um, the regulatory issues we are discussing here and the self-regulation issues. And I think the UK is a, um, a great bad model uh, to discuss about this because in this case we have seen that the UK Press Council in its former um, constitution was not able to prevent the things that then became the Leveson scandal and the News of the World scandal. And so um, if you make sure that the instruments of media self-regulation do function, are supported by um, all market players in terms of media pluralism as well, then probably we can save us a lot of regulatory work um, if this being insured by the marketplace. Please. Hello. Still, good morning. Uh, my name is Libor Manda. I am public affairs manager at Seznam.cz company. We are an internet search and digital services provider. And the Czech Republic is new to Seznam.cz, the only EU member state country when Google doesn't dominate the market in both digital search and uh, or internet search and services. And we are now talking about the media pl pluralism. And uh, this is not also, or one thing that is connected with the media pluralism is also the responsibility of journalists and of uh, the houses who, who published, of many houses who published their, their uh, art articles. And uh, the Court of Justice, uh, or the decision of the European Court of Justice in the Costeja case, and so the right to be forgotten, uh, placed search engines and so Cezanne.cz as well in a position of an arbiter between different and competitive interests of the third parties. So now we are in the position where we are responsible for what has been published to someone else. What do you think about this from, you know, about this media pluralism and about the situation from taking it from our point of view? Thank you. Susanna? I think we shouldn't forget that the Court of Justice made a very important exception to the leading results when it's in the public interest to keep the results. So that's how the court tries to balance the different interests. And if you see the sides that are most impacted by these requests to remove results upon, after a name-based search, it's mostly social media networks or these profiling networks that um, where very detailed profiles about you are, are being made. So I don't think that it's media sites who are most impacted by this court, the court ruling or the ruling of the court that decided that data protection rules should also be respected by those who offer search uh, engines and which imply that data subjects, individuals can go to the search engine and, and, and claim that certain search results are not accurate or not are outdated and which give a wrong impression about you when people type in your name. So that is what the court ruling is about. It's not about censorship. No, I'm not talking, I'm, I haven't mentioned that this about censorship. It was not mentioned by me. Uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, I'm just, you know, should we be the one who will uh, decide what is in the public interest. We are not the one who produce the information. We search it and we, we show it in the, in, in, in the results together with the other ones. But now we are in this position. Going one example, 
we are still, you know, as we are a post-communist country, in many of these uh, results for the listing, there are issues connected somehow with people being accused of being member of state uh, of former uh, state security. And so, should we hire historians to go to the archives and to find the information and be responsible for, for the, uh, so, uh, something that was written by some journalist? I don't think so. But I don't think that search engines have now become responsible. They need to deal with these requests. And um, it's not that the underlying information completely disappears from the internet. It can still be found through other search terms. And it's a result of offering that type of activity and uh, having to respect data pro EU data protection law. It's a kind of, I sometimes compare it with product liability. You d offer a certain product on the market, so you, if, if there's a, a deficiency or a problem with that product, and in this case, because the product um, show certain results which may have a detrimental impact on individuals' lives because it gives a, a wrong impression, it uh, sh still shows information from their, their past which is no longer relevant today. So that is, uh, and uh, your question, of is, it, is it for a commercial entity, like uh, is it for the search engine operator to make those judgments? That's the result of the court ruling and if, uh, if either the individual doesn't agree with a rejection of uh, his or her request or if the um, under or the, the webmaster eh, who has been impacted by the fact that this result no longer shows up after name-based search doesn't agree you can st there are appeal mechanisms you can turn to your data protection authority or to the courts or as a last resort it will be an independent judge taking the final decision yeah, but it will be the judge, so we will bring to the court based on the things we didn't publish. You know, it's still, we are fully in compliance with the national laws and with the European laws but as well. We are for 18 years on the market. To and what we extent are just does that differ from uh, complaints about copyright infringement or, um, as far as I know, search engines like Google have been re removing search results for other reasons as well in previous years. And now it came to them as a kind of shock that also results that refer to information that has been published legitimately, because in the Costeja case, uh, the Data Protection Authority had rejected the claim against the newspaper, La Vanguardia, saying this is, has been published legitimately, it can stay online, but the result needs to be removed from the search result list after a name-based search, because you type in a person's name, you get this detailed profile, and some of the results give a wrong impression, they are outdated, and it's that, that we are talking about this specific situation and not about any, I mean, you should make it bigger than it is, in my view. This is a very interesting discussion, but I will have to <laughs> cut you off. Uh, it's 11, but I think that we can manage a couple of more questions from the floor. If there are any, okay. Um, then I would like to, to give you the possibility for a, for an end remark. What do you see as the challenge? Or be, by the way, before I do that, I actually was thinking we have several people from the EU here, and it would actually be very interesting to to have a comment from one of you on how you see these issues uh, within the the refit exercise that you now will have to deal with. So I challenge you to, to say something. Okay, Lorena. I was trying not to talk this time, but <laughs> okay, if I get a <coughs> direct invitation. Uh, first, maybe a comment. Uh, uh, well, first I apologize to Peggy that I uh, arrived late, uh, but I was very pleased to arrive at the moment where you were describing my favorite project. Uh, uh, one that my unit is funding, which is Reveal. I, I, I really like it. Um, and I got the, the notes from Elizabeth of everything you said, so I haven't missed anything. Um, first, a comment on um, uh, this debate of whether there should be minimum standards at EU level and why uh, there was such a reaction uh, against this idea uh, in the high-level group report. 
And I think we need to be clear that this reaction was not only from governments, it was by the media themselves. So, uh, and it's the same reaction they had uh, on the media uh, pluralism monitoring tool. Uh, and for them, uh, as they explained it to us, uh, the problem is that they see this, first, the, the media pluralism monitoring tool, they saw that as a first step to maybe legislation. Any idea of minimum standards, even if uh, the way the high-level group put it uh, was standards for, for uh, codes of conduct, it was not even really standards for legislation, um, they see it as possible legislation, and as you know, uh, one of the objectives that uh, uh, was in one of the slides here is to avoid any interference from the government. So for them, legislation uh, is like, or could be, like in a way interference from the government. It's, it's their, uh, that's the way they interpret it. So uh, they are really, really allergic to any intervention. I would say not only at EU level, but at any level uh, of, of, its, of what is legislation. Then uh, voilà, they are very, very much attached to uh, self and co-regulation. Uh, I will not bring any assessment. I'm just describing this is, this is the reality. So uh, if you ask me now, should we include any all, of all this in the, in the refit exercise? Uh, as you know, the refit exercise is about the directive, and this directive is with audiovisual. So voilà, if, if now we had to extend the directive to all media, it would be a completely different exercise, uh, much broader than the one we are doing. Uh, but something that, as, as, as you know, we are looking at and, and has a direct relationship with this, uh, uh, is, is the independence of the regulators. Uh, that is an issue that has, uh, of course, an impact on, on media pluralism and, and, and media freedom, I would say, on both, uh, on which, indeed, this is part of the, of the refit exercise, because there was already in the past a public consultation. Uh, I have been at my right, <laughs> the person in, in ERGA dealing uh, with, with the opinion that ERGA is, is providing on this, so this is seen. For the rest, as you know, the Commission is doing plenty of things, you know, in my unit we do a lot of things that are more uh, facilitating actions. Uh, we, 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 we are funding uh, a lot of activities uh, beyond the media pluralism monitoring tool, uh, also the, the um, Center for Press and Media Freedom uh, is another activity, what we are uh, also funding. So we, we are basically acting more as facilitator. We have uh, as you know, uh, organize uh, uh, an exchange of best practice on, on transparency of media ownership. Uh, so voilà, this is, this is, these are the actions that right now we are taking. Whether there will be other actions, I don't know yet, but in the context of REFID, let's say that we are staying on, at this stage for the moment, on audiovisual, unless I'm told the, the contrary, which for the moment is not the case, uh, and voilà, an independence of regulator. Okay, thank you. I guess you will have one minute each then to, to try to, to put some questions on the table, what you see as the main challenges that we will have to deal with now with the converged media landscape that we will be dealing with in the years to come. I think it's a quite big challenge to push for media's more, more and more effective media self-regulation um, without interfering into um, the freedom of journalism and I think this is ever more important after the events we've been watching in the past weeks um, but from my perspective um, more effective self-regulation is probably the only way to ensure um, that media pluralism is being safeguarded without interfering too deeply um, into the freedom of journalism. I think that, the debate, that this debate has again demonstrated that in the media pluralism is a multifaceted concept that requires also different measures at self-regulatory level, but also at, in my view, state regulatory level that has been confirmed by the European Court of Human Rights that states are not only the enemy, but they also need to ensure the right conditions for a pluralistic media landscape to flourish. And uh, uh, an Italian colleague uh, yesterday was happy that um, 
yesterday Media Pluralism came up without referring to Italy. I'm, I'm sorry, I need to refer to Italy because it was actually in the Centro Europa set the case that the European Court of Human Rights stressed that this is a duty for states to put in place the right administrative legislative framework. Um, it's, it's also with other human rights. It's not, it's on the one side there is a duty to restrain for governments and state authorities. On the other hand, there's a duty, um, a duty of abstention and there's also a duty of care on the other hand. Uh, they need to take certain measures in certain circumstances. And I agree, Lorena, that it would be too complicated to put in ownership measures in the refit exercise. But what I'm curious about is um, how is the interaction with other DGs? Because what I really think is a lost opportunity is the anti-money laundering directive. The European Parliament actually suggested to have public registers on all beneficial owners. This would have been a major step forward also in the media sector. And then the council, well, buried the idea again. So is, there is all, are also opportunities for your unit to try to link to other instruments. And <laughs> Okay. You know, I'm, I have all confidence in you. And on that note, I'm going to pass on the microphone. So, so the one point I didn't highlight in my presentation, which I should have done, is it's in the UK situation, the biggest challenge is one around what we call sufficiency. So we can talk about higher levels of plurality or lower levels of plurality, but what we wouldn't advise our government on is what is a good level of plur plurality or a bad level of pl plurality, because there's no analytic test. So we felt it was the responsibility of a democratically elected body to make that judgment about where that threshold should lie. Um, and that's, that's where the debate continues and where we don't have resolution really yet. So thanks to all of you. Um, one thing we definitely could uh, conclude is that the discussions uh, will continue as long as there is media on the importance of securing diversity. So thanks again to the presenters and thanks to the organizer for inviting me here. And now there will be a coffee break, I think. <laughs>